In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is one of those Sundays where the key reading isn't so much the Gospel as the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Did you catch what is happening? Jesus has ascended into heaven. We celebrated that on Thursday. Then he tells his disciples to wait, to wait and to pray intensely, because soon he will send them power from on high. So the gospel, so the reading is about waiting on God's initiative. We've all been in one of those situations where you're having to depend on somebody else's initiative, you know, where they kind of tell you, let's meet at Waterloo Station and then we'll go to the restaurant together. And you get to Waterloo Station and the other person isn't there. And they're kind of just waiting, waiting for the other person to turn up. And it's like, what now? What do I do now? For the disciples huddled together in the upper room, waiting for something they don't know, they don't understand, there would have been a major sense of, what now? What do we do? What is there that we need to be doing right now? They would have had in their minds the fact that Jesus has returned to heaven, and they would know that they are responsible for bringing the news of his cross and resurrection to all people, but they'd also know that Jesus had told them that they weren't ready to do that. They had to wait, they had to pray, because he would provide his Holy Spirit to enable them to complete his mission. They might have even thought, as they were sitting there and praying those nine days, has it happened? Did we miss it? Did, did it happen? And us, do we not realize? How, we're gonna, how are gonna we going to be different afterwards? What's it going to be like? There's something uh, analogous at the end of the prophet Elijah's life. You know, he's taken up into heaven in a golden chariot. And as he's taken up, he throws down his cloak and his staff to his successor, Elisha. And immediately, Elisha clothes himself in his master's cloak, picks up the staff and continues Elijah's mission. In fact, I think the first thing he does is he does a miracle just like Elijah had. He parts the River Jordan, I think it is, and he begins giving the same message of repentance that Elijah had taught. The power that Jesus promises is very much like receiving his cloak. In fact, St. Paul says, all those who have received the Holy Spirit have been clothed in Christ. And so the disciples are waiting for his initiative, for him to send his power, to throw down his cloak upon them so that they can, can continue his presence and power in the world, just as Elisha had continued the work of Elijah. God has decided, however, that unlike with Elisha, the disciples need to wait and pray first because of the enormity of what's going to happen to them. He wants it to be totally clear to them that he is 100% behind this. And when the Holy Spirit has come, there's no mistaking him. The result he brings about, his effect, is something they could never have um, anticipated. It's a bit like you know, in a maths lesson, you know, if you're doing an equation back at school and it said something like x equals 5 plus 2 multiplied by y. What matters, if you want to work out what x is, is to find out the value of y. And y could be anything. And the action of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a bit like that. That is, when we allow ourselves to wait on God's initiative and not to rush in with our own projects and strategies, relying on the five plus two and just sticking with the five plus two, we've got to cover everything in prayer. That way we let the Holy Spirit become the unknown variable that multiplies our efforts Indeed, the factor by which he multiplies can be so huge, he shows our plans and strategies to be of such a small contribution. One of the great crises in our church at the moment is our dependence on strategies and plans and synods. All these human, uh, human um, denominators, these human figures, one plus two plus three, three plus four, the multiplication of the Holy Spirit effects comes through, as Jesus said in the 
reading today. By staying together, staying united as a church, that is not deviating from being the church, and by praying intensely. You know, all this stuff on synod and discernment, I think we would have been far better off had the Holy Father just issued uh, a decree that every church needs to do holy hours every day and Catholics need to be fully united to the church's teaching and fully united in supporting each other. If those were our principles, if we should just start with that, we could be certain that the Holy Spirit would rejuvenate the church in ways that are unexpected, that we could never anticipate. And it's similar in our own lives when we face moments of anxiety, when there's practically speaking very little we can do in a, in a really hard place. It's tempting to try and think of loads of strategies, even though you can't do anything, just going around in circles. Even in our own lives, we've got to pause. We've got to draw near to the other disciples, the other Catholics, and pray intensely. Prayer's contribution, I think, is a bit like, it's like making us docile so the Holy Spirit can work. Prayer is preparing the soil, rooting up the weeds so that the water of the Holy Spirit can bring forth new life, like I said, in totally unexpected ways, raising up saints, basically. Notice in the scene, the disciples, they've returned to the upper room um, and they begin this intense retreat of prayer and they do this with Our Lady, with Mary right there in the middle of them. At the beginning of St. Luke's Gospel, the Holy Spirit overshadows Our Lady and he forms Jesus inside of her. The power of the Most High enters her womb. She's completely pervaded by God himself and she conceives a divine son. At the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, also written by St. Luke, there's a kind of parallel or a repetition of the beginning of the Gospel. The lifeless body of the church awaits the power from on high to animate it, to divinize it, to make it holy, and to be effective and fruitful in the world. It's the Holy Spirit who transforms the church from being just another club or voluntary group to being something totally different. The mystical body of Christ, the continual presence of Jesus in the world, continuing his mission clothed in Jesus, forgiving sins through the sacrament of confession, preaching his infallible teachings through the church's teaching and our efforts at sharing those teachings with others and continuing his mission of consoling and healing and encouraging through our work, yours and mine, in our lives, our day-to-day -day lives. As baptized Catholics, we're not part of some club. We're part of a living spiritual reality, the mystical body of Christ, and it's the Holy Spirit who defines us as such. Amazingly, right now, you and I are the means that the Holy Spirit has to continue Christ's presence in the world. It's a kind of a scary thing, really. But the pause between Ascension and Pentecost that we've got this week is a reminder to us that in this challenge, the infinitely greater part of the work is God's. We have to remain together, united as a church, faithful, praying intensely, so that all our gifts and qualities can be made vehicles for extending Christ's reign in the world. If you haven't been to confession during Eastertide, the sacrament of confession is an essential means to being properly disposed to the Holy Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit take possession of someone and use them as part of the mystical body if there are problems of habitual sin or even just one mortal sin? The more we're separated from sin, the more effective we will be as instruments of the Holy Spirit, fulfilling our vocation as baptized Christians. Our Lady, of course, at the center, at the center of the scene. She already has complete union with the Holy Spirit. She's had it from the first moment of her conception and her entire life. She stands as a model for how we need to be if the Holy Spirit is to make use of us. So we ask Our Lady, Mother of the Church, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, 
to increase the depths of our prayer lives, our separation from sin, our fidelity to the church, so that we can take up, we can take a step up to the immense privilege of being Christ's instrument in the world, his hands, his feet, his voice, drawing others into the true church so that they and all people can find salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.